In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be the doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for today is taken from Jeremiah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm only a youth, for to all to whom I send you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Say, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck you up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. But you dress yourself for work. Arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. And our epistle lesson today is from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the very end of that, and also uh, First 13 verses of chapter 13. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove, to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. 
It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Our gospel lesson for today is taken from Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 31, and this is going to stand as the basis of our meditation. He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching, on the, uh, he was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. He cried out with a loud voice, Ah, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with what authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. The reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. He arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. <clears throat> now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. He stood over her, rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she arose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. The demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. And he rebuked them, would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into the desolate place. The people sought him and came to him, and he would, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. He was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the gospel of the Lord. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee, and trusting thee. For full salvation, great and free. And I am trusting thee for cleansing in the crimson flood, I'm trusting thee to make me holy by thy blood. And I am Trusting thee to guide me, thou alone shall lead every day and our supplying all my need. And I am trusting thee for power. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
They were astonished. His word had authority. And when our, our second child was born, we called the insurance agent, and, and it was the, at that time it was AAL, which is Aid Association for Lutherans. They're part of the group now known as Thrivent. Uh, you know, when I was a baby, my parents took out a little policy for, for me and had it through uh, up to adulthood. And uh, my wife and I both had policies. Our first child was born. We had a little policy uh, that we got similar to the one I had when I was a baby. And so when our second child was born, we called the insurance agent in to kind of set up the same kind of a policy for her. And it's just a kind of an insignificant a uh, little policy it probably costs three or four dollars a month, nothing uh, big, but it kind of pro- pro- uh, provided some kind of uh, protection in some kind of tra- tragic event that uh, there would be a death we could uh, afford a funeral. Well, at the time, my I was attending college at uh, Concordia in St. Paul, and so we call this agent in, and he's a young guy. He just got, went through training, just uh, new in the business. And he comes to our house, and he sets up all of his stuff on our kitchen table. And he's going through the flip charts, and he's going through everything that he was taught in his, his training. And uh, I mean, it was obvious that um, he was doing everything the way he was taught. But he wasn't getting to what we had called him there for. You know, we wanted a policy for our child. Uh, but by the time that he was done and following all of his flip charts and his calculations, my wife and I both had to increase our wor- our, our uh, life insurance policies to a half a million dollars for each of us. And we still didn't even talk about the child's uh, policy that we had called him for. But he was just doing what he was mimicking what he had been taught. He wasn't teaching as one who had authority or comprehending uh, what was there? It was just kind of a mimic or a, a, a you know, just copying uh, what he had been taught. Uh, well, in our gospel lesson for today, Jesus is in the synagogue in Capernaum. It's in the region of Galilee. And the people are amazed because he's different than some of the other. I mean, Jesus is at this time is 30 years old. And this is when the 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 rabbis, the teachers of the church first began. And typically, you know, you got a a new student, you would expect them to have some kind of blunders or just kind of doing what they were taught to do. Uh, But here Jesus is different because he's teaching as one who has authority. He has command over the material that he's teaching them. Well, why shouldn't he? I mean, we know who he is. Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the author of that very word that he's bringing to this group of people in the synagogue that day. He is the authority. Even the scribes that had years and years and years experience or the the Pharisees that had years and years experience, the rabbis, the teachers, they all have to bow down to his authority. Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt among them. He's the embodiment of the word. I mean, can you imagine if you were going out and you're going to buy a different car and you go to the Ford dealership and the person that is dealing with you is Henry Ford. I mean, Henry Ford, can, he, he's the authority on Ford. He knows the vehicles. He designed them. He he knows all the parts. He knows the the process of putting them all together. He knows the specifications. He is Ford. So here we have Jesus. He's teaching on the synagogue. He is the Word. Jesus, while he's teaching there, we're told that there is a, a man possessed with a demon there, and the demon speaks up. He knows Jesus' authority. He says, we know who you are. You are the Son of God. You are the Holy One of God. Jesus rebukes him. He commands the Spirit to come out of him. The Spirit throws the man down. The Spirit comes out without hurting the man. And the people are marveling. Who is this? 
You know, even the disciples later on, you know, in the Gospels, as you're reading through them, when Jesus performs some miracles, like the calming of the sea during the storm, the disciples themselves says, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey? Who is this that can command the demons to come out? A little bit later, Jesus is in the house. And uh, one of the disciples' wives is, is ill. Jesus commands the sickness to leave her. And she gets well, and she immediately gets up and starts serving them. Who is this? It's the Word. This is the one who in the very beginning said, let there be. And all this came about. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without Him, nothing was made. It was that word that was that creating force. When God said, let there be, Jesus is that let there be. He's the light. He's everything that created all things. <clears throat> no, the authority that God has over things, you know, so what does that mean for us? You know, that authority, when we became Christians, also somewhat transfers to us. I mean, we're still sinful and unclean. We still struggle with some of this. But um, uh, years ago, I was uh, getting ready for an elders meeting at the church I was serving. And that church was right across the street from a battered woman's uh, shelter. And it was a closed place. You couldn't go in to, to minister to any of the people that were there. They were there. Most of them were very frightened of, of men in particular because of the way that they had been treated. But every once in a while, one would come over to the church. And as I was preparing for this elders meeting, uh, there was a lady that came over and she asked if she could speak with me. And what she was seeking, she wanted money uh, to get a train ticket or a plane ticket, bus ticket, I think it was a bus ticket she wanted, to go to Chicago. I said, well, why do you want to go to Chicago? She said, and she started telling me her story that she thought the devil was after her and she needed to get out of town. She needed to go someplace and she thought she had family in Chicago that the devil wouldn't hurt her there. And yeah, I, I guess I was being a little bit facetious, but I said, well, doesn't the devil go to Chicago? Uh, well, it doesn't bring any comfort. But then what we started talking about is that I, I asked her if she was Christian. And she said she believed in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And I started opening up the scripture to her and I says, do you know that the Bible says that you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you? that there isn't anything in all of creation that is able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, that even the devil, even though he's a roaring lion prowling about looking for whom he may devour, he has no power over you other than what you allow him to have. Even the devil has to obey Jesus. And so when you tell the devil to get behind you in the name of Jesus Christ because you're a Christian, the devil has to obey don't doubt it. Believe it. Now, it took some conversation, and the elders' meeting had gotten started, and I just sent a word to them about what was happening in my office, uh, just a little bit, not any details, uh, but that I was in a counseling session, and the elders started praying for what was happening in the office. And we had a prayer in the office between this lady and myself, and by the time she left, she was convinced that she had that power uh, because of what Christ has done for her. Jesus Christ died on the cross to suffer and die for our sins. And so God tells us there isn't anyone that can bring any accusation against us, not even the devil himself, because of what he's done for us on the cross. It is God who justifies Now, the devil's going to keep bringing up all of our bad things. He's, he wants to weaken us. He wants to divide us. But we can be strong in the word and know that he is defeated. Yeah, he's still busy. Don't get me wrong. He's still out there prowling about looking for whom he may devour. And I think he's actually very busy in the church. You know, anytime you have divisive things come up in the church, 
You know, that's not godly. You know, some of the things that I hear some congregations arguing over, um, a lot of money, you know, about decorating the church, about the colors that are used, or, or about who's using the kitchen and using supplies and, you know, all these kind of material things. You know, the devil likes to sow these kinds of discord. <clears throat> My home congregation, uh, when I was confirmed, uh, they had gone through quite a bit of turmoil. There was always tension there. And uh, at one point, uh, there was the head pastor, an associate pastor, and a third pastor that were serving that church. It's a large church. And the senior pastor was going on vacation. And he told the elders, I want you to take care of business while I'm gone. And you know what I mean. And what he meant was, I want you to get rid of the associate pastor while he's on vacation. Because they didn't get along. Uh, there was arguing and fighting and just discord in the church. And then this group would follow that pastor and that group would follow that pastor. Well, the pastor went on vacation. He came back and he saw this elder and he says, well, did you take care of business while I was gone? And the elder says, yep. He's gone, and so are you. They got rid of both of them. And that prompted the district to send in some counselors to find out what was going on. As I mentioned, it wasn't just these two, this group of pastors that were, there was always tension even before these pastors had come. And what these counselors found out was in, in, uh, in their discovery process of interviewing various members of the church, they found out that it all went back to an argument that took place in the 1950s. This was the 1980s, you know, 30 years later. But it was an argument that took place over some stupid little thing uh, in the kitchen of the church. Uh, someone bought a piece of equipment someone else didn't think they should have and I mean, and then the, the war started. And the people that we're fighting today don't even remember what that argument was until it was brought to light. And there's only one healing that can take place for this kind of division. You know, we need to confess our sins. You know, the devil delights in that kind of division because when we're fighting amongst ourselves, the rest of the world also pays attention and they don't want to have any part of us. They don't think the gospel of peace that we're bringing to them means anything. Well, it has power when we confess our sins. You know, there are still going to be people that says, well, why can you talk to me about being holy when I know who you are? I've known what you've done. And they can bring up your past. But for the Christian, we say, yeah, I am a sinner. But I confess my sins. God is faithful and just. As imperfect as I am, he forgives me all of my sins. It's not my desire to be sinful and unclean. God doesn't give me a pass to keep on doing those kind of things. I want to be the person that God wants me to be. And the past is the past. I can't do anything about it. But what I can do is try to live my future to his honor, to his glory. To live in his mercy and his grace. And that is also true for you. There isn't anyone that can bring any accusation against us. It is Christ who justifies us. Now, Paul had that struggle. In Romans, he says, The good that I would, that I do not, and that which I would not, that I keep on doing. What a wicked, what a sinful person I am. Who's going to save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. It's only through his mercy and his grace. God has empowered us through the forgiveness of sins to live as his sons and daughters in this kingdom, to live under his authority. And as his sons and daughters, we reign with him. We don't need to be slaves to our past. When we confess our sins and he forgives us our sins, our slate is wiped clean. The devil can try to bring it up, but we need to remind the devil that he's been defeated. 
there is going to be an ultimate victory one day. When death is swallowed up, the last enemy to be defeated, there'll be no more death. There'll be no more dying. There'll be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain. All of it will be past. Until that day, we live to his honor and to his glory, trusting in his hope and his purpose to live in the authority of his word. And to do that, we need to be in his word. We need to let that word become a part of us in our life. We need it to become you know, our first language. You know, I don't know if you've ever learned a, a, a second language. I always have a hard time with it. Even, even sign language that was in English, <clears throat> by the time in my mind I would translate the word into kind of a symbol, or if you translate uh, a word into English and back into the other language, it's just such a slow process. But the more you use it, the more it becomes your primary language and it becomes more fluid. The same thing is with the Word of God. The more we're in the Word, the more we become familiar with it, the more we, we let it become a part of our life. It becomes the language of our life. It becomes that power that allows us to stand in, in, in front of Satan himself. Now Martin Luther, he had a... And uh, a crude way sometimes in, uh, in pointing out the power that we have in Christ. And I'm going to clean it up a little bit, but he said that Christians should live in such a way as to pass gas in the face of the devil. That we give him no place, we give him no honor, we give him no respect. Because he is the enemy. And that enemy has already been defeated. The battles may still wage in our life, but we need to live in such a way as to bring God honor and glory, to confess the times that we fail, but to live in the baptismal grace that we have each and every day as his children, to his honor and to his glory. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the victory that you give us over sin, death, and hell. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd help us to live in that victory each and every day, that we not fall back into old temptations and old sinful ways and uh, give no place for the flesh to operate. You know, the woman that was caught in adultery, uh, the people were ready to stone them, and you told them, well, you without sin cast the first stone. Nobody could cast that stone. And then he pronounces the forgiveness upon that woman. But he also said, now go and sin no more. God doesn't overlook our sin, he forgives it. But he also empowers us to be his people. He wants us to live sinless lives. And I know as long as we have this flesh and blood, that's not going to be an easy task. There's always going to be this struggle between the old and the new Adam that lives in us. But the new Adam needs to be victorious through that mercy and grace. We ask that you be with uh, the people that serve us in our community. We ask that you be with us uh, as a church and as a church body. Um, be with the leadership of Trinity Lutheran Church uh, as they lay out plans and how to best meet the needs of the people of this congregation and community of getting the message of Jesus Christ and crucified out into the community that people living in the fear and the, um, the defeat of their own sinful nature can experience uh, the victory that is theirs in Christ through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We ask that you be with our leaders to grant to them guidance, and wisdom, and understanding that in all things they seek your knowledge and seek your truth and to be able to govern accordingly. Uh, we ask that you be with those that are ill. Uh, Empower the hands of doctors and nurses and others charged with their care uh, to know those things that are necessary to bring about health and healing. We pray for those that have been given terminal diagnoses. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you grant to them hope, that they see beyond the present struggles of this world uh, to embrace the eternity that lays in, in store for them through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. They look forward to being clothed with immortality and this perishable with the imperishable. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would allow love to reign, 
that in everything that we say and do it not be according to the letter of the law, but because we love each other. Through your honor and to your glory we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.